discussion about the heated rod, was it? So let's take a look at what we did last time. Okay. I started an example last time, which is model of a heated rod. And just to quick question, so most of you have done differential equations? Four two seven eight? Or you're doing it right now? Have you done anything like this? No. Heat equation? No. Heat equation yet? Okay. Well, again, you're not going to be required to solve this equation in any other than numerical way. Okay? So you should be fine. But by the end of the semester, you will actually look at some of the equations like that. So the way heat equation goes, you basically dissipate heat. And if you did not have any communication with the environment, you would have a heated rod literally like this. Here, then you would have one temperature on one end, the other temperature on the other end. In order for any transport to happen ever, you have to have a gradient in some physical property such as temperature. And if you have a difference or a gradient in temperature, then basically heat will transfer from the front higher temperature to the lower temperature until it equilibrates. So technically, if I didn't have any communication with the environment or I wasn't losing any heat to the environment, this would be really a linear equation. <laughs> or my, my temperature would go linearly between the two. It would be relatively easy. And I would get that simply from the fact that d squared t, dx squared, is zero, right? So if my second derivative is zero, that means that t is a linear function in x, right? Because then my second derivative disappears. But I do have, I'm basing some energy because I'm exchanging uh, with the environment and there's this heat transfer co coefficient h. And how much I'm actually exchanging with the environment depends at every point on the temperature at that point, which is t here, and the temperature of the environment. So difference between the two drives heat transfer to the environment, and that adds a little bit of interesting stuff to the solution, because now I will not have a linear solution to the equation. Okay? So I'm going to have a little more nonlinear, because here, where I have larger difference, so basically at t4, I'm having probably somewhere around more than 150 degrees centigrade at the beginning. The difference with the ambient is very large, so there will be more loss of heat to the environment on this end than there will be on this end. And that will uh, cause uneven things. Okay, so basically I'm modeling the, if I'm going to solve this numerically, the way you model, and this is called discretizing your equation, you define points where you want to solve this problem. So here I decided to define four points in between these two boundary points. Okay. I can decide to go for four, I can decide to go for six, eight, eighty, eight hundred, as much as you'd like. But here I want to look at the smaller system, so I'm going to go just for four. Okay. And they're equally spaced, so basically they're at zero, two, four, six, eight meters, okay? And the total length is 10. And I'm looking for T of X at those points. So I'm basically looking for this T1, which is T of X1, T2, which is T of X2, T3, which is T of X3, and T4, which is T of X4. Once I found those four, I'm gonna say I'm done. I numerically solve this problem. If I want a finer discretization in between and more points so that my solution is smoother looking, I can simply add more points. So the point of solving things numerically is to solve basically at discrete points in your space. This is in one dimension. In two dimensions, I would go into two dimensions and create myself a grid, and I would solve on that grid. So let's go and solve for this. Now, one thing that I know, okay, is that for every point that I have here, T1, T2, T3, T4, okay, at each point, 
my equation has to be valid, okay, because that's what's governing the transport here. So basically, at each point, okay, so basically equation, differential equation, is valid at each point. And I will use that to set up actually a system of equations. And the way we will do is we will remind ourselves, so what is my equation? My equation is d squared t dx squared plus h times ta minus t is equal to 0. Okay. In order to basically figure out or set up the equation, I will also discretize this differential equation, and I will approximate, okay? This is approximately t of x plus some small delta x, so d squared t dx squared minus 2t of x and plus t of x minus delta x delta x squared. So if you remember, just like we approximate a slope of a function, the basically difference between the two points, difference in values of a function, divided by the difference between those two points, this is a similar approximation just for second order derivative. So this is called a so-called central difference, difference approximation. for d squared dx squared. So it's very similar. If you remember, for dt dx, we had t of x plus delta x minus t of x divided by t delta x. Right? There's a number of so you could also say t of x minus t of x minus delta x divided by delta x. So there is variations of that. It's also t of x plus delta x half minus t of x minus delta x half divided by delta x, and so forth. There is a number of versions here. So now, actually, I will write what this means at every point. Okay. So at point T1, or X1, my T of X is, I call it T of X1, it's T1, if you remember that. What was that sound? <laughs> This was my rod. Okay. So my delta x here was 2 meters, right? So what is my t of x1 plus delta x? <coughs> I'm waiting. What is that? X1 plus delta x is x2. So that's t of x2. So that is what I call t2. Right? Yes? And what is my t of x minus delta x? So that's x1 minus delta x is x0. So that's my boundary condition. That was 20 centigrade degrees, right? Okay. So basically, if I discretize this at point x is equal to x1, then what I will have is that this entire term plus h times this is equal to 0, right? So that is t2 minus 2t1 plus t0 divided by delta x squared 
and again, delta x is 2 meters in this case. plus h, and h is something I know, it was 0 0.01, times Ta, Ta is also something I know, it was uh, 20 Celsius degrees, right? Oh, that was 20, T0 is 40. Right? Minus T at x, and I'm right now at x1, so that's T1. Equation at point x1. <coughs> yes? So, what don't I know in this? I don't know t2, I don't know t1, I do know t0, that's my boundary condition. I know h, I know 20 here. I should have left it as ta or something. Just not to. You know, I'll just. I know this, this is 20, and this is 2 meters square. T0, I also know it's 40. Okay? So unknowns are T1, T2, and the rest I know, it's some numbers that I already have. So this is a linear equation in T1 and T2, correct? Okay. So I'm just going to proceed. I'm going to write that same equation, so repeat for every point. Uh, I can clean it up a little. So when I do, I can multiply by delta x squared. So I'm going to have minus 2t1 plus t2, and then plus T0, plus HTA, minus HT1 is equal to 0. And I need a delta X square. So then it's minus 2 minus delta H square H T1 plus T2 is equal, and everything, all of the other numbers that I know, I'm going to put on the other side. And that is equal to delta H square, HTA, and minus T0. So it's a linear equation in T1 and T2. Yes. Did I do this correctly? Hmm? Is that a delta x squared before h? Yes. So I'm multiplying by delta x squared here. Okay. So then I do the same thing at. So this was at x is equal to x one. At x is equal to x2, what is the discretization of my operator? So basically, I'm rewriting that differential equation at x2. Okay? So now I'm approximating d squared t to the x squared by this. So it's going to be. When I approximate, it's going to be T of X2 plus delta X minus 2T of X2 plus T of X2 minus delta X divided by delta X squared plus H T A minus T of X2 is equal to zero. So that's the discrete version of my differential equation at point x is equal to x2. Does everybody see this? Okay. So I just plugged in, instead of x, I plugged in x2. That's my point right here. Okay. 
x2 plus delta x is actually my x3. x1, x2 minus delta x is my actually x1, right? So what I have here is t2 minus 2, uh, t3 t3 minus 2t2 plus t1 divided by delta x squared plus hta minus ht2 is equal to 0. Yes? I can clean this up too. I know numbers. I know h. I know ta. I know delta x squared. So this is a linear equation. T1, T2, and T3. Yes? I keep going, and I do that essentially at every point. And I will get four equations. <coughs> so I will actually just then, so this, I will just clean up and do the result at the end. But basically, you proceed doing this. So do the same at x is equal to x3 and x is equal to x4. Same procedure. And I can notice that this differential operator, if I'm at a point x2, I'm going to depend on the point before me and the point after me, but not others, right? Because that I'm basically this is using these divided differences, so I'm reaching to the point just left of me, to the point at the center, and to the point right of me. Right? So in every equation, I will really only have three, uh, three variables that I'm working with at a time. So at t2, I'm going to have t1, t2, and t3. At, t, at, at x3, I'm going to have t2, t3, and t4. At t4, I'm going to have t3, t4, and t5, and t5 is already a boundary condition, which I know. So basically, you are always depending on sort of a narrow band around yourself. Yes? Yes, <coughs> which is why I chose only four. <laughs> but technically, you can do this. So basically, we are going to get something like this. I'm going to write it as a, in final numbers. 2.04 t1 minus t2 is equal to 40.8. And then I have uh, minus t1 plus 2.04 t2 minus t3 is equal to 0.8 minus t2 plus 2.04 t3 minus t4 is equal to 0.8. And finally, minus t3 plus 2.04 t4 is equal to 200.8. And 200 is because of that t5 that is 200. So you can see how only three neighboring points sort of or temperatures at only three neighboring points. And I can see a structure here. So could you actually, if I had a 10 by 10 system, how would it look like? Yes, what would I have on a diagonal? So this is actually, look. Right, so 204, 204, 204, 204. Okay, minus one, minus one, minus one, minus one, minus one, minus one. Okay, and then T1, T2, T3, T4. And the only, so all of the middle elements would be 0.8, and the ones close to the boundaries have that boundary value of temperature added to them. 
So even if this was 10 by 10, I would know how to write it. There is actually a structure to it because this sort of depends. And slightly, this would slightly change because my delta x would change to the actual number. But I would have a same number of diagonal. Okay. I would have minus 1 off diagonal. And here I would have these boundary values show up at close to the zero boundary and close to the endpoints. So these are my endpoints. These are 40 and 200 by, by my end temperatures. So if I left those general numbers, you could actually see that here. But this is called the so-called tri-diagonal system. They show a lot, lot in numerical solutions to differential equations. They're fast to solve. So if I was doing the Ossian elimination of this, all I have to eliminate is one term, and I'm done in this column. Right? Remember how in the Ossian elimination we were resolving this? So basically, all you have to do is like one below here, one below here, one below here, and basically in one step at every uh, field element you're done with sort of making your system. So they're much easier to solve. Don't you have to make the ones that don't also be there? Hmm? If that you're, idea. yes. So the way we did by hand our notes in elimination, we went to upper triangle system. So then you do only below. And then after that, you do back substitution. But you could, if you got rid of these, Okay, then you will get a diagonal system and you can directly solve. So yes, that's a possibility. Does everybody is everybody following this conversation? Some of you might not care. And if this just went above your head, just let it go. <laughs> let, it, let it go. Let it slide. So easier to solve, to do Gaussian elimination. Because all of these that I didn't actually, I was lazy writing them in, they're zero. OK? That's why it's easy, because all, the rest are zero. Coming up as an exercise program, okay? Then you want the system. 
So you could actually, the system we said is like, okay, we're going to eliminate things below the diagonal, and I'm going to start from here. So my pivot, pivot element, this is 1, 1, so I'm going to start from 1, and kind of delete everything below, the 2, then below 3. So there, that gives me a structured algorithm. Now, yes, you could start from this end. You could actually create an upper, instead of upper triangle, uh, upper triangle matrix, you could go lower. But at the end, you would have what's called forward substitution, not backward. Does that make sense? So there's multiple ways uh, you can go about that. Okay. So this basically, this is a very common thing. So this is schemes that do this are called sort of finite. This was example of finite difference schemes for solving differential equations. And key processes discretize. This was in one dimension. So discretize, find the discrete points where you're solving the equation. And at every point, discretize your differential operator as well. So instead of writing second order derivative, I'm going to replace second order derivative with something that depends on the values of that function in my neighboring points okay, and the spacing that I have in between. And that allows me to write a system <coughs> of linear equations. As a matter of fact, whenever you're solving differential <coughs> equations numerically, sooner or later you will arrive at the system of linear equations to solve. So when I was saying that systems of linear equations are really at the core of engineering solutions and numerical solutions, that was not okay? <laughs> So basically, majority, you can, in your, whatever you learn in differential equations, you can solve 5% of your problems analytically, the rest you need to go to numerical solutions. And for those, Ultimately, it's also going to be hidden. So you're working with software, so you don't know what the software is actually doing, but this actually gives you an idea of what is actually behind the software. So in reservoir simulation, same thing. You have Darcy's law that you have to disregard. Then Darcy's law ultimately sets up a system of linear equations that are solved. So no matter what discretization of the differential equation you use, Ultimately, you will be solving linear systems. So, essentially, this is at the core of these problems. Are solutions to linear systems of equations? So I'm typically looking for a quantity, temperature, pressure, velocity, right? And those temperatures, pressures, and velocities at discrete points are actually unknowns in my linear system. So no matter what you do, that's what you end up solving for. Okay. So these were some examples of how do we set up. Is everybody done with it? So I will go back quickly to review a couple of points and just give you an idea of what else are we going to discuss in these systems. Huh? So again, when we were solving for elimination, okay? Our key in a couple of examples that we saw, we would write a system in so-called augmented form, and then I would focus on eliminating these elements that are below what I call pivot positions. So my first pivot position is A11, okay? And then I would find suitable number okay, to multiply the second equation with, and subtract or add to the first one, and then basically eliminate. So when I replace my second one with some linear combination of this first and second, okay, 
I will get a zero here. And I proceed. So then I do that for the third row. Okay. Then I'm done with the first column. I go to my second position. I eliminate this one. And then I am in an upper triangular system that I can solve with backward substitution. Great. So when doing by hand, I can just look at the numbers, figure out which linear combination works, replace, keep going. If I'm a computer, I need to be a little more organized than that. So essentially, if you were a computer, then the coefficients that you actually want to multiply your first row with in order to eliminate second row. So, so this is just now creating things a little more abstract. So you can actually then focus on solving this using a computer. So if I multiply this A11, if I multiply it with A21 divided by A11, okay, and I subtract this first row, I'm going to get a zero here, right? So if I multiply A11 times A21 divided by A11, I'm going to get A21 minus A21 is going to be a zero. Okay. So if I'm telling computer what to do, I'm going to go and tell the computer to multiply first row by coefficient A21 divided by A11 and add it to the second row. Yes? Are we following? Okay, take a piece of paper. Let's follow on paper. So my point here is to create an algorithm. And I'm going to take a piece of virtual paper. <laughs> okay. So this piece of virtual paper And I'm going to write down a system, A11, A12, A13, A21, A22, A23, A31, A32, A33, B1, B2, B3. So my first task, so task, is eliminate position A to 1. Using this pivot A11. So I'm looking to replace, so replace second row with and I'm wondering what should be the coefficient I tell my computer. So I'm just going to do some coefficient times my first row. So this is my first row, second row, third row, plus second row. Okay? That's that linear combination of the two. So basically, when I replace it with the, what I want to, actually what I'm going to get here is C times A11 plus A21, right, in first position. And then C times A12 plus A22, C times A13 plus A23, and C times B1 plus B2. Is that correct? So I'm just keeping general numbers. This is what we were doing when we were solving problems. And then actual numbers are in place, and everyone goes, oh, yeah, that's easy. Because I had minus 1, minus 2, minus 3, and it was easy to see what to do. But this is now just keeping these general numbers because I need to tell computer what to do. Yes? So this, the C is just here. I'm looking for what C should be because I need to program. And that's the ratio between the two. So what 
C works. So what do I want this position to be? C times A11 plus A21 has to be zero. That's how I'm picking it, right? So if I had A11 as two and A21 as minus two, everybody said, they'll just add them up, right? Because coefficient was one. Okay, so it's easy to see, it's easy to spot when you have actual numbers, but now I have to tell a computer what to do in any general situation. So my target is that when I do this, this number is zero. So what is C? <coughs> there we go. So this is going to be negative A21 times the first row plus second row. Great. Now in computer lingo, what is the first row? If I have matrix A, what is first row? How do I write first row? Yes? In computer lingo, second row is So this, in computer lingo, if I was writing code, I would say C equals to minus A21 divided by A11, sorry for, How do I write, this is exam number one, <coughs> how do I write <coughs> second row of A equals to C times first row plus second row? That's it. Yeah. So that's part of my algorithm. Now I want to repeat this for second row, then third row, then if I have more, and I'm going to do this when I have more, fourth and fifth, up to which row? Not the extent. <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't go into the computer. However many rows I have in the matrix. So if I was writing code, okay, I would do this from row 2 to row n, where n is number of rows for a. So my second blue shirt up there, that is not paying attention to me because he's in a striped blue shirt. <laughs> Hello? You do have a blue shirt, right? Yes. <laughs> so, so, I want to repeat this 
operation on a computer, not only for row two, but for rows through to n. What are we going to write? Hmm? <coughs> From 2 to m. So what's the piece of the code I'm going to write? So there's 4, and I'm going to call those rows i. i is 2 to m. Yes? So now I want to replace this. So what am I going to do? So this piece of code that worked for row 2, I want it now to work for row i. c equals 2. So key thing is to replace 2 by i, right? Because I want it to work for every i. Divided by a of i i. And then this replacement of the row, a of i comma, is c times a of i plus a of 2. Now, if this is, if my a is actually an augmented matrix, then I'm actually at the same time working on b's as well, right? because they're the last part. But let's assume it's not, and I have to do the same for B, okay? I would also replace B of I as C times A, uh, what was this? This was not, this was one, and this was I. So it would be B of 1 plus B of I. Okay? And Is everybody clear with this? Oh, because that's for the... Yeah, so this is for B's. This is in case my B's are stored separately. So this is just comment. I'm going to put it as a comment. In case my B vector is stored separately. That part is actually up to you. How are you designing your problem? <coughs> Great. So this actually works for my entire first column. <coughs> okay. Yes? Now I actually want to go. And uh, this was actually, nobody said anything. This was 1, 1. Oh. So this works <laughs> for column 1. <coughs> okay? So for column 1, my pivot position, pivot position, is a of 1, 1, and I start here from 2. Yes? Um, where you said b of i equals c times b of 1, did it not be i minus 1? This is b. So, but when we go like, to the lower rows, are we still going to operate to the first row? So, yes. So I'm using first row to eliminate all the positions below. Okay? Now, good point. Now, I actually don't want to do that just for the first. I want to continue for position A2, 2. And then A3, 3. And as many as I have. Yes? So there will be an outer loop here. Right? That will replace my 1 with my position that will go from 1, 2, 3, 2. Yes? Anything? What does that say? In case my B vector is... My B vector, so I could keep stored. stored. Okay. It's stored separately. <coughs> so is this clear? So this is actually how I would translate what we learned, our algorithm that we learned, into computer language. Okay. You will get to do that on Friday. Now, I am not here on Friday, and there will be Rahul will be teaching instead, and we will be doing this problem. And same.
leaving for Monday, so I will also not have office hours. I'm actually out of the country for the next four days. So, but come to class because this will be very important to know how to program. And you will have to, not on this Monday, it's on 14th. So, this will be continued next time. Yes, so this will, you will work on this on Friday and you will have to upload it on Monday. So that's the assignment I posted ahead of time. Yeah, yeah, yeah.